and to JK's left is Mike Brotherton. He began teaching in the English department at Labette Community College in Parsons, Kansas in 1976, and he retired in late 2006. At Labette, he coordinated the restoration of the college's art collection, a project nominated for the Governor's Arts Awards, and the renovation of the college's Hendershot Gallery. For three years, Brotherton served as chairman of the Humanities Division at the college, and in addition to his professional duties, he was active in college theater productions, organized numerous special exhibits for the town, basically, and instituted the Zazu Pitts Film Festival. In 2008, Brotherton co-authored with David Maddox a book called Images of America, Parsons. Brotherton earned his Master of Arts degrees from Pittsburgh State. Thanks for the help, Liz. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today to be a small part of this celebration, and I'm especially excited to be here to resent, uh, represent Labette Community College, who this semester is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Um, uh, when Liz first talked to me, this was our conversation. <laughs> and, huh? That's what you, I wrote it down when you talked to me on the phone. <laughs> I have the original uh, to show you. Okay. So uh, that's what I'm here today uh, to talk about the Lebec Community College uh, art story and the restoration story, which basically is resilience, restoration, and beyond. Okay. Um, the beginnings of the art collection starts with the beginnings of the high school in Parsons. Uh, the first high school classes met in 1871, but uh, the high school didn't get its own building until the 1880s. There's a picture of the building. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, it was torn down to build a new uh, Safeway supermarket. Okay, uh, but uh, just two blocks down, uh, the new high school and the community college, which at this time were one entity, um, uh, the new building, and then the old main, uh, where the college is now, as part of the college complex, was originally a 1920 uh, East Junior High School. The collection, as it uh, pertains today, began with a, the first class was in 1923, the first graduating class was 1925, and as you've heard throughout the day, uh, it was kind of a tradition for people or classes to go together and make a gift to the institution. The uh, first uh, Parsons Junior College class was a, a gift of this etching. Um, I think it's uh, English, I can't remember the title of it, but I can say that we're happy to say that we still have that piece, okay, almost a hundred years uh, later. I took a picture, not a very good one, of Anna Lerner. You'll read a little bit about her in the exhibit. Uh, she was a very influential art teacher. It seems like the theme of today is the art teachers who have touched people's lives and continued the legacy, and she was that art teacher in Parsons. Um, she was well connected in the state of Kansas. Uh, I think there are letters between uh, Anna and San Zane in the, in the gallery collection, and we also have an oil from 1927 in our collection that she did, and, 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 uh, and it just stayed, stayed with the school. Whoops, too far. Um, basically, the core of the college's collection, and I should explain that when the high school and the community college separated in 1965, the high school didn't want the art. So the college took the art uh, and made the move. But the uh, core of our collection is what was called the Carnegie Art Teaching Sets. And what that was, was in the 1930s, the Carnegie Corporation, one of its goals was to disseminate art and music education teaching sets to high schools and uh, uh, colleges across the country. And uh, like I say, it was 
35, I think. Uh, our college got one in 1939, which was pretty late in the process. And if you really want to know all about the Carnegie Art Teaching Set, you can go online. There's an online magazine called the Carnegie Reporter, uh, and the article is called Investing in America's Cultural Education. You can't read it from where you are, but I think it's fall 2010, and it tells you all you want to know. We didn't get a music teaching set, but we did get a, an art teaching set. And fortunately, um, although it really wasn't always the best thing, but someone was meticulous that everything that came from this set got that Parsons Junior College stamp on it. I mean, it's there. So when it, <laughs> everywhere. Um, and um, let's see, uh, the collection was a series of books over 250 books that were uh, given to the school of, about art. And over the years, those were just put on, you know, using the Dewey Decimal System in different parts of the library. But when we really started putting this collection back together, we knew which ones was which because there was that PJC stamp in <laughs> uh, uh, every single one of them. Yeah, yeah. Usually on the title page, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, and you can see a wide variety. Also, the most important document that surfaced during this process of trying to put this collection back together, once we found out what it was, was a fine arts teaching set catalog. It has, it's a list of every item that was given in this art teaching set. So besides books, there were 1,500 mounted photographs uh, you see one of the boxes in the current exhibit. There's lots more boxes. It came in this uh, oak case, which we still have. And uh, the artwork was, uh, of course, pre-slides, so it was passed around, you know, people could look at it. But those were the basic categories uh, for the mounted photographs uh, to use like in art education classes. There were, uh, frame, there were color reproductions and part of the grant was money set aside to have the reproductions framed locally. They didn't come framed. And um, I think we have located about 70 of those. And um, they're um, what you would expect, mostly European art. Um, some of them still need some conservation. Uh, the last slide shows you some water damage that was in some. Some were hung in the sunlight for a long time and have faded. But amazingly, the, the majority of them um, are, are in good shape. And they were hung in the halls and in classrooms uh, originally. Okay? The core of the original artwork also came from the Carnegie Collection. And um, I believe we got 16 original pieces of art through this Carnegie teaching set. And they were chosen to illustrate different types of printmaking. So some of them were fairly contemporary at the time in 1939, but some of them go all the way back to the uh, 15th century, where there are um, uh, examples of a page from a Bible, you know, and then hand, co and hand colored. But they were all chosen to illustrate different types of printmaking processes. And you can see now, the Sanzane was not part of it, but I put that in there because during our restoration process, we picked one piece that we thought people would identify with and, and to be the symbol for the restoration campaign that we, that we were planning. And I believe that piece is in this exhibit uh, here today. And, um, uh, it, oh, they were in horrible shape. Um, people have been talking about basements and boiler rooms and closets all day. Ours was in a storage room in the back of the theater. All the pieces had been stacked along the wall. And uh, as often happens, when things slide, they would all slide down onto the floor. Over the years, people paid no attention to them. If they wanted to get something in the back of the room, they tried to walk over them and missed stepped on the glass and broke the glass. Nothing was ever done about it. Uh, it, was, it was just a mess. Okay. 
Now, uh, our story really starts in 1987 and goes to 1996. I laughed about this earlier. You'll see later on our five-year plan. But if you do the math, <laughs> you can see, you can see where, what happened there. Okay. Okay. Uh, our first part was to do research. We really didn't know at first what we had. We didn't find the catalog until quite late in the process. And, uh, but we had heard uh, about uh, the Carnegie Corporation, so we contacted the Carnegie Corporation. They said, well, all of uh, Carnegie's papers that have to do with his philanthropy are at Syracuse University. So we contacted Syracuse and they said yes, and, uh, but you have to pay somebody to do the research, you know, which I think is pretty standard. So we paid someone to do the research, um, a month or two later, they gave us a complete report. They even had the original application for the grant filled out by the superintendent of, of schools uh, in Parsons. And so once we knew what was in the uh, uh, package, the arch teaching set, we started searching and setting goals and vaguely started thinking about funding. It was a long way out. So there's some articles. Um, Lebec Community College is looking for lost artwork. There's that, another copy of that Carnegie Reporter. And so amazingly, um, several people um, came forward and said, well, I taught there 15 years ago, and when I left, I told them I liked this piece, and they said, oh, just take it home, you know. <laughs> and they came forward and, and, and brought pieces back, and we're still getting pieces. Uh, 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 back from, from people. Well, some people say, well, I've had it for 35 years. Uh, I'll make sure it gets back to you, but I want to keep it a few more years. So at least we know where it is. Okay. So we had a five-year plan, uh, which took us uh, basically nine years. And um, uh, but we were most, uh, most concerned about funding. And we made a, a decision early on this was an ad hoc committee. Um, it was an ad hoc committee of uh, people uh, in the art department, in the um, uh, graphic design department, uh, some people in the English department, just people who were concerned about the state of the pieces that we saw uh, around. But we made a decision to just kind of work, work on our own. It wasn't a secret and the school did uh, support us in terms of, you know, postage and mailing and telephone and using the time. But um, at the time, to be honest, we thought that was the best way to go because we were worried about red tape and, and things slowing down and, and things not getting done. So we thought, well, we'll just work kind of underground and see how far we can get on this process. And that worked great up to a certain point. But when we got to the point on funding, we hadn't institutionalized this project in any way at all. So there was um, you know, no line items in the budget. We had to go back and educate the institution about it. But we first thought, well, let's talk to the Carnegie Foundation. They gave it to us to start. Maybe they'll help us. You know? And then we thought about private foundations, state and local grants, private donations and then fundraising activities. Well, the Carnegie Foundation was very, very nice, but they said since the 1930s, our, our focus has shifted in our philanthropic endeavors. They explained to us that their main focus now was world peace, which you really can't argue about. I mean, <laughs> you know, you can't say, well, why did you change? <laughs> You know, world peace. That, that's good enough for me. Moving on. Okay. And so, um, so they were out of the picture, basically. We we wrote grant we wrote grants for private foundations uh, for lots of reasons. Timing was wrong. Funds were low. Um, we have a whole envelope full of rejection letters and rejection postcards. So we didn't find much there. We looked into state and federal grant opportunities. We did apply for several, but the same thing, the answer was no. Um, so uh, we were starting to think, okay, how's this really going to happen? 
Um, I was glad to know that you were talking the $25,000. Um, our estimate was $35,000, and this was in 1980s uh, dollars. And uh, uh, that doesn't seem like a lot today, but when you don't have a line item in the budget and you don't really have anyone at the institution in charge of helping with the budgetary process, it, 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 it took a while to get institutionalized. And that's one thing I wish we had done sooner. So we had to turn to local resources. Okay? And that's where we found our, our best success. Uh, the Lebec Community College Foundation uh, um, bought into the process of restoration and provided us a one-time grant to help pay for the original um, estimates on conservation, the uh, original appraisals, all the, all the things you had to do before you could really get started. Uh, we are lucky enough in Parsons to have individual donors who are our champions of the arts, and um, many of those donors gave um, quite large sums to help with the process. And uh, we had fundraising efforts on our own. I, I didn't bring them up here because I didn't want to mess up the camera or anything, but I'll show you afterwards. The, um, that flat box in front of you is one of the 1,017 t-shirts that we sold with examples of the artwork uh, on, on the uh, t-shirts and the plastic Walmart bag, I believe, uh, are empty boxes, gladly empty boxes of approximately 500 boxes of note cards with examples of the artwork from the collection that we sold on them. And we, were, we made quite a bit of money on that. But most importantly, once the word got out, um, the institution be, uh, was very supportive and over a period of years, a line item budget uh, appeared and uh, it was built into the humanities budget. And uh, with, that, with that, over a period of four or five years, the last five years, we were able to raise the money combined with all of these things to get everything done. Uh, uh, once the process of restoration started, it was two years. That's our brochure. I couldn't decide whether I should put it so you could read it, or <laughs> if, if the artwork was that way. So I thought, well, maybe you should read it. And I, but that, that, that's a sideways art view, but not a, 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 the art collection. That's a brochure that we uh, uh, did. The appraisals went through, the paper conservation, we got bids. Uh, we did the matting and framing ourselves over a period of summer uh, with the help of the graphic design department. We meet once, one, one day a week to cut mats and to uh, make frames and everything. And we bought the glass pre-cut, but that saved thousands and thousands of dollars doing it uh, on our own. Um, once all this happened, our, our local alumni magazine touted the uh, Carnegie Art Restoration Project. And these are, uh, that's a picture from the inside. I think that uh, Goya is hanging in the, in the exhibit as well. And for special donors who had given substantial amounts, we had a, a preview of the, uh, uh, of the collection before the grand opening. And that's a picture from the newspaper from that. Um, we had a big opening reception. And this makes me feel so old. When we first started doing this, it was slides and slide carousels. And I put down at the bottom dog and pony show because I cannot tell you how many civic organizations, clubs of all different kinds from a dozen different towns that members of the committee uh, got, you know, there's always someone looking for a program, you know. And uh, we signed up for everything <laughs> that we could and uh, uh, to get the word out and, and to build the excitement about it and then had an opening reception. Where did I go? Oh, this is the beyond. So it was, uh, it was done. Uh, basically, our original goals were done. But then all of a sudden, we realized that in a good way, progress generates progress. We've got this great little collection now. Where are we going to put it? 
We're going to put it back in the storage room that where we found it? No. Um, boy, our gallery looks really shabby. What, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to maintain the collection? Um, we didn't even have security and climate control in our uh, original gallery. And the idea was always to add to the collection and not just make it a static kind of thing because people were excited in the community about this process. So we carved out space next to our gallery for storage. Uh, that's one of the storage spaces there. That's all fireproof and climate controlled there. We, um, uh, people on the gallery committee, built the storage boxes ourselves to, to save money. And there's a Margaret Whittemore that's sliding into Buttress Barn, I believe, that's sliding, sliding into that. And um, we're about out of space, and we're in the process of trying to um, uh, get another similar storage space right off the gallery. It makes a lot of sense to have the storage space just feet, uh, feet, feet away from the gallery. So um, we carved out space, we renovated the gallery, we built storage facilities, and we have things organized. Now, the collection doesn't stay on display all year long. Uh, certain pieces uh, appear in administrative offices, and it's usually up at least one semester of the two of uh, the three semesters, if you count summer. But sometimes it, it, it is in storage. Okay, so once again, progress generates progress. Um, uh, with the help of the LCC Foundation, the Foundation established an art acquisition fund and um, uh, established a, an employee payroll deduction plan so employees at the institution could have money taken out. It goes directly into the art acquisition fund. And just a couple of years ago, the Parsons Area Community Foundation established a, an art fund for this. And I'm very happy to say that although um, it's not in place right now, uh, there have been, well, I'd say there's at least one very large endowment plan for that fund that will happen eventually. And that one endowment will generate enough funds to keep the gallery renovated, to um, help with um, ongoing restoration, to provide for funds to bring in extra shows, and to acquire new art on a regular basis. So just that one endowment, once it um, uh, becomes activated, pretty much ensures the, the, the continuation of, of, of this. Okay, so there's our first gift. A hundred years, almost a hundred years later, um, on our 90th anniversary, that's the gift um, to the fund. That's a, a, an oil on canvas by Stan Hurd, the Kansas artist. And um, we have plans now for um, a, a gift to the uh, collection to celebrate the 100th anniversary. We've been doing it about every five years, you know. And uh, it's a good way to get funds in and to, and to mark milestones as well, okay? Our current uh, uh, focus uh, is on regionalism. And as we were walking to supper or lunch today, someone said something about regionalist, and I said, oh, that's our, that's our focus. And, and they said, oh, well, that's interesting. And I said, well, that's our focus for two reasons. Number one, that's kind of what we had to start with, and that's about what we can afford now. <laughs> you know. Uh, so in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, and these are all lithographs or, or, or um, woodcuts or block prints. Uh, we've acquired a Thomas Hart Benton, a John Stuart Curry, um, a set of Margaret Whittemore, some Avis Chitwoods, Peter Hurd, uh, Gold Reed, and then that uh, most recent uh, Stan Hurd piece. So we feel very good about the process, and we still get things in. You know, people call us all the time and say, well, I have this, are you interested in it? And I don't know how you feel about it, but 
we never say no because you never know what's going to walk in the door. Now, some things that walk in the door, we say, thank you very much. Where can we store this forever? You know, <laughs> and uh, but some things are, are real treasures. Okay. Um, recently, we got a call from a, a person who said, we have um, some pieces we found in the attic of the, of the house we bought, and they're in really bad shape, but do you want them? And uh, they were by Ken Riley. Ken Riley was a, a student at uh, Parsons High School in the late 1930s and was um, uh, championed by one of the art teachers. So much so that he um, talked to Ken Riley's parents about him going to art school. And they said, well, you know, we're poor. Uh, how much money are you going to make as an artist? Um, we don't think so. But the deal that uh, the art teacher brokered with the Ken and the um, parents was that uh, if the parents would okay it, the art teacher agreed to pay the first year tuition to the Kansas City Art Institute for Ken Riley so he could study under Thomas Hart Benton. And these were pieces we think that were produced around that time because they have kind of, of a Benton-esque look to them. And these read from the, uh, this is uh, photographs from the restoration process. These read from top right, which is the, sh the worst shape, to the um, left and then bottom right and to the finished product at the left. And uh, uh, the people who gave it to us, uh, gave them to the who us were amazed at what what could be done. I was amazed too. I had no idea how much you could bring something back. Here's a, another uh, example of that restoration. Same process. You can see the shape it's in. What better way to say who the artist was and when was it printed than to type a piece of paper and then glue it <laughs> to the piece, right? You know, that way, that way you'll know. Yeah. So, but anyway, you can see how it turned out. It, it turned out to be a great thing. So, so uh, we try to do similar activities that people have mentioned today. Uh, one of the things that um, we share a partial block with a local elementary school. So they are literally 500 feet away from our gallery. So on a regular basis, it's easy for them to walk over to the gallery and see exhibits. And sometimes we do themes. This one was from quite a few years ago. But we took uh, Margaret Whittemore pieces and kind of took all the color out of them and turned them into and made a coloring book. And then the students got a coloring book. And over a series of uh, several uh, months, they just, with no help, no idea of who Margaret Whittemore was or what these originally looked like, colored them. And then, once they were all done, they brought their coloring books to the gallery and got to see the, the pieces, you know. And some of them were, uh, 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 they, they, there wasn't any real right or wrong. Actually, some of them I really, really liked. But th I put this one up here because many of the people uh, 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 laughed about this one when they realized what it was. I don't know if you're familiar with this Margaret Whittemore. It's called Young Robin. And so, you know, the person who thought it was a bluebird, no, you know, or, or did it pink or something, but, but uh, they, they like doing it anyway. And then we sneak in a little bit of history about the artist as, as well. So that's our story of sticking to it, going through a restoration, and trying to keep the importance of art uh, alive in, in the school system. And um, I'm just happy to have been a small part of that and thrilled to see the exhibit here today and how many people have, have made that happen. It gives me cold chills. So thank you very much.